Okay, so before the break, um, we were talking about one-dimensional codes. <clears throat> and um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background. Uh, obviously, if you are a user of these codes uh, or you have access to the user manual, uh, you can get into this in, a, in way more detail than I'm able to do here. Uh, but basically, my point was that we discussed the equations that are solved uh, in those 1D codes, and uh, I'm just uh, reviewing that for you here. So <clears throat> before the break, I mentioned that we, uh, in these codes, discretize the uh, system ducts, like I've shown over here, uh, and then uh, solve the equations using various numerical methods. Uh, I mentioned that uh, the speed of sound was an important parameter, and there is a uh, solution technique called the method of characteristics that I like to mention because it basically helps you understand uh, one-dimensional fluid mechanics and, in fact, 3D fluid mechanics, all fluid mechanics. But basically, if you look at a plot of distance along a duct, all right, and the uh, points that you see here uh, might be the grid points in a, in a numerical simulation. Uh, as a function of time, so time is increasing this way, and here's a picture of my duct, just for your example. At this particular time, we may have a fluid particle moving at velocity v, located, as I've shown by the little circle here. And at a later time, that particle has moved to this location. The slope of this line is the vel velocity of the particle, right? dx dt is the velocity of the particle. Now, the particle in the duct uh, is traveling because, for example, there's a pressure gradient across this duct saying to that particle, you should flow, right? In order to try to equalize the pressure. So how is that information communicated to the particle? Well, it's communicated through pressure waves which travel at the speed of sound. And in fact, any point in the, in the flow is continuously generating pressure waves and sending them out to the, the fluid everywhere in the domain. And I've just drawn two of those waves here, waves uh, that are traveling in the right direction called right running waves that have a slope equal to the velocity of the fluid plus the sound speed, all right? And waves that are traveling in the left uh, orientation here, the green ones, uh, left running waves that are traveling at the velocity of the fluid minus the sound speed. So when these waves arrive at a fluid particle, they basically inform the fluid particle about the uh, flow conditions ahead and behind that uh, particle position. So these are called characteristic lines. And <clears throat> if you think about discretizing the flow field into uh, a, a, a distance delta x between node points, uh, this uh, re leads to an understanding of why there's a time, co time step constraint in a numerical method because information can only flow from uh, the adjoining grid cells uh, if you satisfy this constraint here. You cannot just arbitrarily take a giant time step because if you do that, you will not be getting information appropriately from within this region, delta x here. So basically, the uh, absolute magnitude of the velocity and the sound speed, uh, reciprocal of that times the, the uh, spatial uh, step size is what determines the time step. That's called the current friedrichs levy condition uh, that is uh, essentially required either for stability or for accuracy in numerical methods. So I just thought I'd mention that. Now it turns out that you can go actually much further with the method of characteristics and Moody's book goes into this in great detail. Uh, because you can use that to actually solve the uh, equations that I showed before. Uh, these days, in commercial codes, the method of characteristics is really only used at the boundaries of the domain, and the interior uses a finite volume approach, but it's still instructive to understand the method of characteristics. So imagine that here's my duct, and I've discretized the duct into steps delta x apart. Uh, and I know the solution at a certain time. So remember, this is time axis and this is space axis here. So I know the solution at points one, two, and three. 
Well, if I look at these characteristic lines that are carrying information to the next time level, time <coughs> n plus 1, I see that all those lines intersect at, I've called it 0.4 here, uh, and, the, and carry with them information about the flow conditions at time level n. The equations, those mass, momentum, and energy equations, can be manipulated to show that certain quantities are constants or are changing along those uh, characteristic lines. In particular, along the right running characteristic line, changes in pressure are related to changes in velocity uh, times the acoustic impedance, rho times c, the density times the sound speed, and a source term. And similarly, along this left running characteristic, I have a very similar equation, but with a minus sign and another source term. And then along the particle path, this is the line that has slope equal to the velocity of the particle, I have another characteristic equation that relates pressure and density changes. OK, so if I have these three equations, I can discretize them. And in particular, I can interpolate between known solution values at points 1 and 2 to find the values of the variables at uh, the right running origin wave origin and the particle path origin and similarly between 2 and 3 for the left running particle origin, and essentially create three equations for three unknowns, the velocity, the pressure, and the density at state 4. So that's how I solve my system of equations. Now these source terms, F, G, and H here, are functions of the heat release, the friction, the uh, area change, and so on. Um, and it turns out that these terms are zero if you have an isentropic flow. In other words, a flow without heat addition, a flow without friction. And in fact, you can see from Gibbs's equation that the change in entropy is basically dp over c squared times d rho. You can see that from up here. So h is 0 uh, if you have ds equals 0. So <clears throat> the isentropic flow limit is a very interesting uh, special case of the method of characteristics. Because in that case, you can show that along characteristic lines, dp over the acoustic impedance, rho c, plus the change in velocity, uh, is equal to 0. Uh, this is called the uh, Riemann invariant. Uh, if you integrate this equation, you can show basically that 2 over the ratio of specific heats minus 1, 2 over gamma minus 1, times the sound speed, plus or minus the velocity, is a constant along these characteristic lines. Um, notice that the Mach number, the velocity divided by the speed of sound, uh, comes into these uh, equations very prominently. And in particular, if the Mach number is greater than 1, the slope of this left running characteristic line here is no longer negative, but becomes positive. And what that tells you is that information cannot propagate <coughs> from uh, uh, upstream. So, these are the equations that we uh, use in that isentropic limit. And just to give you an example of how you might use these equations, let's say I have a duct, and maybe there's a valve here and a combustion chamber. And I open that valve, and the pressure ratio between the combustion chamber and the, the stagnant flow in my, in my pipe is 1.25. So that uh, pressure difference sets a wave in motion, which propagates down the tube to tell the environment here that you better be prepared. There's flow going to be coming because we have a pressure difference between the combustion chamber and the environment. So here's my uh, XT diagram. Here's my wave propagating down the tube. And it separates regions 1, which is the quiescent fluid in the pipe, from region 2, fluid that's been put into motion because its pressure is higher than the pressure in region 1 by 1.25. Uh, we're given the properties of the uh, undisturbed fluid, the temperature, and the pressure. And the question is, can you find the speed of the gas that's going to be leaving the combustion chamber, uh, your exhaust gas mass flow? OK, well, we can do that using the method of characteristics because <clears throat> we have a left-running characteristic line that connects regions 1 and 2. And along that characteristic line, the Riemann invariant that I described on the previous slide is a constant. So properties in region 1 
can be related to properties in region two. All right, so I need to know the sound speed in regions one and two. Well, in region one, I can calculate the sound speed using gamma RT, right? It's the speed of sound, the ratio of specific heat, gas constant, and temperature. It's 448 meters per second. I know the pressure ratio, and I've assumed isentropic flow, so I can get the sound speed in region two. Remember, the sound speed <coughs> is related to temperature, and I already have a relationship between temperatures and pressures for uh, isentropic flows. And so if I plug it into my left running characteristic equation, I can calculate the velocity of the gas that's going to be uh, discharging out of my combustion chamber following this pressure wave with a magnitude of 1.25 pressure ratio, and it's 72 meters per second. So all of this, of course, is going on inside your computer code. I'm just showing you an example here of how these codes would correspond to that event, right? The valve opening, the pressure in the chamber being higher than the atmospheric pressure, giving rise to waves which cause the flow to occur uh, in those ducts. The other thing you can do with this type of analysis is what's called Lagrange ballistics. <coughs> Lagrange apparently was interested in what happens when a cannonball leaves a cannon back in the, one of the French wars. And he, he argued that in the case of that cannonball leaving a cannon, it's traveling at a velocity very much less than the speed of sound. Well, it turns out in an internal combustion engine, the peak velocity of the piston is around 20 meters per second in a racing engine. Speed of sound we just saw is like 300 meters per second. So basically, the piston is hardly moving as far as the sound speed is concerned. So if we just take a simple one-dimensional analysis, here's my piston, <clears throat> and we look at the distance between the head, which is stationary, and the moving piston at velocity v piston. Uh, we can identify on our xt diagram the location of the piston as a function of time as it's moving to the left here. And we have our left running and right running characteristic lines that are bouncing back and forth between the head and the piston. And every time they bounce back and forth, they have to change a property of the fluid because the piston is moving, but the head is stationary. So if you look at those Riemann invariants that we spoke about before, uh, every time the wave reaches here, it has accelerated the flow because of the moving piston. And suddenly it realizes, wait a minute, I've got to be stationary. The velocity has to be stationary. So that means I have to increase the pressure to overcome the kinetic energy of that fluid moving toward the head. That means I have to send a pressure wave back into the fluid saying, wait, there's a wall over here. Well, by the time that wave gets this side, it sees, oh, wait a minute, there's a wall moving. So I've got to send that information back into the fluid. And this goes on back and forth between the head and the piston. So using the equations that I discussed before, you can show basically that <coughs> the uh, pressure changes are going to be related to the velocity changes. And if one uh, uses uh, the uh, equations I discussed, you can show that the, the net or the, the magnitude of the density change is related to the change in velocity divided by the sound speed. If the change in velocity, in other words, the difference between the piston velocity and the head here, is very small uh, compared to the sound speed, d rho, or changes in density, are very small. So you can use that fact to <coughs> uh, simplify the equations considerably. So the density at any position in the combustion chamber as a function of time is only a function of time because we've just said that changes in density are very small spatially. So we can go to the mass conservation equation and get rid of spatial changes in density and solve this equation for the velocity profile. And what you find is that the velocity of the fluid in the combustion chamber is a linear function of distance from the piston. So basically the gas has a velocity profile that's linear. The gas is just stretching or compressing like an accordion. Um, and if you use that result in the momentum conservation equation, you find that the pressure changes in the combustion chamber are also very small. They depend on the acceleration, x double dot being the second derivative of the piston position with time. Uh, so they depend on the piston acceleration. And if the piston acceleration is small, the pressure is also uniform everywhere in the combustion chamber. And so 
if you're an experimentalist, you can put your pressure transducer any place you like in the combustion chamber, and you measure a pressure, and as long as you're not having knocking phenomena or detonation waves or anything that are approaching the speed of sound, that pressure measurement will represent what's happening in the combustion chamber. And that is exploited. In fact, I've already exploited it when I discussed the first law of thermodynamics and so on. I just spoke about pressure. I didn't say, oh, this is the pressure in the top right-hand corner of the combustion chamber. It's the pressure. It's the same everywhere in the combustion chamber. We're going to see cases where that's not true, right? When we have detonation effects and knocking and so on. But for uh, standard combustion, it's a very good assumption. And as a result, in all of these codes, you'll see basically just a single pressure trace um, as part of your analysis. Okay, so <clears throat> that deals with the combustion chamber. Now, the gas exchange process itself, getting the flow into the combustion chamber and leaving the combustion chamber. Um, so, as I mentioned, the valves open, and here we have, as a function of time, the valve lift, if you like, uh, for the uh, exhaust and intake valves. Uh, generally, there's a small period of overlap here. Remember I mentioned that you open the valve, but really nothing happens until that information is propagated all the way to the atmosphere saying, please send me some air. So you might as well open those valves a little early <coughs> to get that information uh, out such that when the valves, when the piston starts moving down, information uh, or flow can enter the combustion chamber more effectively. Um, so, how do you get more air into the combustion chamber? Well, that air has to pass through an air filter. You don't want losses there, a carburetor or a throttle. Uh, it has, there's also, uh, you add potentially with port fuel injection uh, fuel in the intake runner. These are all complex processes that incur losses. Uh, for example, if you inject fuel in the port, the fuel is vaporizing. That changes the temperature of the air. So it's quite a compli complicated process, and typically 3D modeling is needed to really understand how those <coughs> flows are established in the ports, how they separate when you go around corners, and <coughs> eventually how they impact the nature of the flow inside the combustion chamber itself. Because this flow in the combustion chamber is what's very important for mixing the fuel and the air and for generating turbulence, which helps with flame propagation, for example, in a spark ignition engine. All right, well, how else can you get more air in the chamber? You can use supercharging, which means maybe a, 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 a compressor established that is, uh, forces more air into the chamber. Um, and we'll be talking uh, next about turbocharging and so on. But this all is under the category of engine breathing, all right? You want to get as much air into the combustion chamber as possible uh, so that you can burn as much fuel as possible to generate power. All right, so the complicated flows, we've got separating flows, flows going around corners. These are all effects that are multidimensional, right? And to model that in a one-dimensional flow is quite uh, tricky. What is done in typical codes is to use empirical correlations. So you saw that friction factor that I mentioned before. You can use that friction factor to essentially represent the flow losses that might occur in a diverging duct or flow recirculations, uh, separations, um, and essentially create a table of uh, coefficients that correspond to the dimensions of your one-dimensional duct system. So for instance, in the Ricardo wave code, <coughs> here's a sec section of duct with a certain inlet diameter, a certain exit diameter, a certain radius of curvature. Uh, and by using uh, correlations that are developed and have been uh, the result of measurements and so on, uh, a certain friction factor, Cp here, that relates the pressure difference across this duct uh, to the velocity uh, or kinetic energy of the flow uh, is imposed. And that allows you to model uh, realistic geometries without having to do the full three-dimensional, multi-dimensional uh, simulation. Uh, so here's just a picture of the pallet from the Ricardo wave code. Uh, here you have your intake atmosphere, here's your exhaust atmosphere, here's your engine with a fuel injector. Uh, 
a very simple geometry, uh, just shown for an example here. Uh, now, you also have valves, right, that are, are uh, intake valves and exhaust valves. And those are also are going to have flow losses associated with them. What is typically done is you will feed in an experimentally measured flow profile that basically measures the amount of flow that can enter across a valve as a function of the valve lift to diameter ratio. So knowing the valve lift, which basically is a hardware uh, input for your particular engine, uh, you can then read up off this curve what the corresponding flow rate is of the fluid crossing um, the valves into the, or out of the combustion chamber. There are also parameters for heat transfer and, you know, uh, so on in these 1D codes. They're quite sophisticated. Okay, so why are we interested? I mentioned you want to get as much air as, as you can into the combustion chamber. And so uh, there are other uh, ways that are pretty innovative of doing this. Um, this is a plot here of bas basically how much air you can get into the combustion chamber compared to the theoretically maximum amount uh, if you were to uh, fill the air, the chamber with air at the pressure of the environment um, and as a function of engine speed. So as you speed up, as I mentioned, these, these waves, these uh, pressure waves that instruct the fluid to start moving into the combustion chamber, are going to have less time to do this because your engine's running faster, right? So one way of dealing with this is to change the length of the passages uh, that communicate between the environment and the engine. And so, for instance, Mercedes, uh, about 10 years ago, introduced an engine that had a three-stage resonant intake system where at low speeds, you would use curve one here, which is basically uh, a curve of volumetric efficiency versus engine speed. Um, and in this case, you would choose a short path by, with two butterfly valves here, you can control the length of the path. You choose a short path so that um, you could uh, uh, maintain good wave action and resonance. Uh, whereas at high speed here, uh, I beg your pardon, I had the other way around. At high speed, you want a short path. At low speed, you want a longer path. And by doing this, you can keep the net or the uh, volumetric efficiency as, as high as possible over the whole engine operating range from, you know, in this case, 1,500 to 4,500 RPM. So there are ways that one can do this. And uh, those of you who have ever been involved in uh, formula car projects and so on are probably pretty familiar with engine tuning. This is a really interesting plot out of Haywood's book uh, where he discusses volumetric efficiency, um, where he says, okay, we want 100% volumetric efficiency. In reality, there are going to be losses in the system, which he calls quasi-static effects uh, that might have to do with your air cleaner or, or things that are, are uh, outside of the discussion here. But let's say that that was where we start. Now, let's look at the contribution to the actual engine volumetric efficiency curve, which is this curve labeled G here. You saw a picture of that on the previous slide. Well, the first, uh, and this is engine speed down here. First thing that he looks at is the effect of charge heating. So you've got hot uh, intake ducts, all right, from the uh, coolant that's uh, at a fairly high temperature. What does that do? The heat transferred to the intake flow gases reduces the density of the fluid, which means that you get less air into the combustion chamber. So basically, there's a hit on volumetric efficiency just due to heating of the intake flow. It's going to be bigger at low speed because there's more time for that heat transfer. All right? High speed, that effect is minimal or minimized. Next thing is flow friction. OK, we saw that term F in the equations. right? Uh, the faster the flow moves, the steeper the velocity gradients at the walls, uh, and maybe even flow separation effects. And this is, of course, going to uh, impede the amount of airflow into the engine. Um, and so uh, flow friction, of course, increases with speed. That brings you to curve C here. Um, yeah, C. Um, so the next effect is choking. 
So we, remember we mentioned that the speed of sound uh, plays a role. If there are places in the, in the intake system where the flow velocity reaches the sonic velocity point, uh, you cannot send any more flow into the system because basically the system is unaware that more flow is needed if at some point the speed of the fluid is already at the sound speed. So that's what happens with choking. Now the RAM effect is, uh, okay, we've, we've changed our valve timing in such a way that we have a, a uh, momentum established in our intake flow. Even, say, after the piston starts compressing the flow, we still have flow coming into the chamber because of the memory effect, and that's our RAM effect here. Okay, that brings us to E here, and then let's see, what else is there? Tuning, uh, again, we have that issue of the exhaust and the intake valve overlaps, uh, and then, oh, backflow. If those valves are open at the same time, it's possible for exhaust, if the exhaust pressures are higher than the intake pressure, for flow to actually pass from the exhaust back into the intake. And at low speed, this can be a significant problem, right? Because there's a lot of time for that. So this is where variable valve actuation would be really great because you could change the valve timing using a valve a phaser, a cam phaser, uh, to try to avoid this. And so anyway, when you add all these things together, you, get, you can explain the shape of the volumetric efficiency curve as a function of speed. All right, well, <clears throat> as I mentioned, uh, three-dimensional so CFD simulations are very helpful because they can pinpoint some of these phenomena uh, and help you understand the nature of the flow uh, as it enters the combustion chamber and mixes with residual gases from the previous cycle, uh, for example. So 3D simulations are widely used to try to uh, improve the volumetric efficiency and understand mixing in the combustion chamber. So let me talk a little bit about CFD. Um, in 1973, uh, there was uh, what's been called the Arab oil crisis here in America. Uh, and uh, the United States Department of Energy decided that something needed to be done. Uh, I remember I was at Princeton University in 1973, and uh, there was no gas available. We had to drive to the New Jersey Turnpike to get a ration of gas. We, they would give us five gallons. Uh, and then we had to drive back here, use up, you know, I have a gallon. Or <laughs> <one>. <laughs> um, so this was a very serious uh, event in the United States history. Long lines of people at gas stations all fighting it with each other. So what the government did was they formed the Department of Energy and they went to the government labs, the Los Alamos National Labs, that were working on weapons codes. And they said, why don't you use this fantastic technology to help the automotive industry? So basically, they started a program that was very successful that led to the development of computer codes, uh, a whole bunch of them, that eventually became the Kiva codes uh, from Los Alamos National Labs. Um, and uh, these are all open source codes that are available through government websites uh, and are widely used uh, by people, universities, and so on for CFD codes, CFD simulation of engines. Uh, along with the open source codes, there were commercial codes developed, uh, notably at the Imperial College, um, the STAR codes, and then other commercial codes, uh, AVL's code, Ricardo's code, also uh, Fluent, and then more recently, Converge, Forte, and a bunch of other codes. So these are commercial codes that are also becoming widely used uh, in the industry. There are annual user group meetings uh, that are, a lot of them are associated with the Society of Automotive Engineers, uh, Congress, and so on. If you're interested, um, you can certainly find out more about those looking uh, at the various meetings. Okay, so what do these 3D codes do? Well, I mentioned the 1D code, the equations. Well, the equations are the same, right? We have mass conservation, momentum conservation, and energy conservation. Uh, and in addition here, I'm showing species conservation because when we're dealing with combustion, we have to worry about how the fuel and the air, let's think of them just as two species, uh, mix. 
and combust. In addition, we have sprays, all right, in direct injected engines. So in the mass conservation equation, the differential equation that we discussed before, we have a term here involving a source of mass due to a spray, or spray droplets vaporizing uh, in your computational domain. Similarly, uh, we have diffusion of species. We have combustion source terms as I convert my fuel to products. And we have spray terms, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, momentum conservation, we have source terms due to the spray. The superscript S always means spray here. Because the droplets that you inject into a combustion chamber transfer their momentum to the gas, right? And that's a source term for the momentum. And similarly, we have from the energy equation, we've already seen we have heat release due to combustion. We actually have a sink here due to vaporization of the droplets in a spray, and so on. So basically, in a 3D CFD code, we're solving these equations on a numerical mesh, like you see in these pictures here, that accounts for moving valves, moving piston, and a lot of the complexity is because of the motion of these valves and also the, trying to keep high fidelity in the geometry of the combustion space. Uh, and so uh, a lot of work has been done uh, uh, originally, as I say, by the Los Alamos group and now uh, introduced into commercial codes. Uh, since the Kiva code is open source, it's widely used even at, in our group. Uh, because it allows us to essentially add models or change models without having to get uh, more information from commercial vendors than they are usually prepared to give you. Um, and just to give you an idea of how that code works, uh, it's a main program, roughly 50 subroutines. Uh, you initialize by basically uh, assigning the fluid variables at every computational zone, uh, point in your computation. Um, and then there are these three phases of, this, of the simulation where you basically, in phase A, do the spray, the combustion, uh, and so on, um, those uh, subroutines. And then in phase B, you do the fluid phase calculations, the mass, momentum, and energy uh, equations. And then phase C is where you essentially um, move the mesh such that you account for the mesh motion due to piston movement and so on. Uh, in the Kiva code, <clears throat> they introduced an idea called a snapper. And here the idea is, if this is my piston and here's my mesh above the piston, as the piston moves, you can see I'm kind of shrinking the size of this cell compared to this one. When that cell reaches some critically small dimension, I decide I'm just going to uh, make what's left of this cell join the cell above it, and so I snap the location of this boundary to join the piston surface. So that's been a really effective way of adding and deleting grid cells as the piston moves or the valves move into the, uh, the uh, domain. There are other ways of doing this, of course, but I'm just mentioning the historical ones. Okay, so uh, for this first part of, this, of the uh, course material, I'm going to finish up here by just showing a couple of slides. Um, first one relates to CO2. Remember we mentioned greenhouse gases, <clears throat> and uh, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, trying to reduce the amount of CO2 from automotive sources. But if you look at this chart, transportation is this little piece down here. This yellowish region here is CO2 emissions from fossil fuels you can see that we're about one-third, right? The other two-thirds are industry, home heating, all the rest of stuff. So I think we're getting a bad rap here, all right? But anyway, um, we've got to do something about reducing CO2. This stuff here is uh, forestry, I believe, uh, and land use. So there's quite a bit of CO2 emission from that. Um, what else is there? Methane. Uh, here's N2O. And here's freons from your refrigerants and so on. The bottom line, though, is that as a function of time, so this is 1975 to current here, you can see the CO2 increasing. And remember that 1.7 parts per million I mentioned that we are pumping into the air from combustion sources or vehicle combustion and so on. 
Uh, this number turns out to be around 2 ppm. So that's a fairly good estimate. So every year we increase the amount of, of uh, greenhouse gas by about a couple of parts per million. And this is a concern. Okay, <clears throat> so transportation is about one third of the total energy use in the United States. Uh, internal, engine, internal combustion engines are among the most efficient power plants on, on the planet, right? But research is needed to improve them, and that's what we're going to be focusing on. Industry faces many challenges uh, to meet emissions regulations, for instance. But if you look at what's happened over the last 20 years, this is particulates and this is nitric oxide. And the regulated emissions for heavy-duty vehicles uh, prior to uh, the 1980s, there were basically no emissions regulations. Uh, the first thing that came was a uh, NOx suit regulation out here in 1988, that is. Uh, and remember, I mentioned 10 grams per kilowatt hour, that's somewhere around here, of NOx. 0.6 uh, gram per kilowatt hour or brake horsepower hour of particulates. Well, that's a big black smoke cloud that you see on really old engines. Um, that's a lot of smoke. Uh, and you can see we're down here now in 2010. There's been a huge cleanup in both NOx and particulates. So I think this is one of the most impressive charts that you can show, uh, just showing what research has accomplished over the last 20 years. Of course, we still use a huge amount of fuel. The uh, United States uses 20% of the world's fuel. Um, and uh, along with that is all the CO2. So questions about this first part. <clears throat> OK, so what I will do next is move to section two, and we'll just start that before the uh, next break. I'm going to go pretty fast through this material um, because it's kind of specific. Um, what I'm going to be focusing on is turbochargers and engine performance metrics um, at, at first. And then in the final hour, I'll give examples. All right, so turbocharging. Why do we need a turbocharger? We want to get as much air into the combustion chamber as we can so that we can burn as much fuel as we can and therefore generate power. One way to do that is through uh, forcing air into the combustion chamber with a turbocharger. So this was invented in 1925, uh, and it was an idea to basically push air into engines um, now, there are, of course, uh, disadvantages, but the disadvantages are not nearly as large as the advantages as seen in this plot here. This shows the specific torque in Newton meters um, units here. Uh, again, uh, on this side, specific power. The standard spark ignition naturally aspirated engine is down over here. You can see that through the use of turbocharging, uh, there have been significant improvements. And in fact, if you look at a, a modern uh, turbo diesel, we're up here. This is somewhere around 150 Newton meters per liter. Uh, that's a significant amount of power compared to the 50 or so that we were back down here. And then this is turbocharged gasoline engines. So they can even uh, approach over 100 uh, Newton meters per liter. Okay, how does this work? <clears throat> so the idea is that um, here's our internal combustion engine. The red shows the hot exhaust. The blue is the fresh charge. So we take in air from the environment, pass through some sort of air filter. We can have a supercharger, which is basically mechanically connected to the engine through some belt over here which sort of starts the process of uh, uh, inducting air. Here's our air passing through a compressor and then into the, through a cooler into the engine. Now, the compressor is driven by, in this case, a turbine. So we have these high-pressure gases exiting the combustion chamber. 
Some of them we can bypass the turbine through a waste gate. The rest we pass through the turbine and then exhaust through our after treatment system. So that's pretty much a, uh, this is in a VW turbocharged uh, engine, uh, pretty much state of the art uh, system. On my, I think on the next slide I show some variations where you can use low stage, uh, low, uh, this is the slide after this, low and high pressure turbines. Let me just discuss this a little bit. This gives a bit more detail about the waste gate over here. So here's my exhaust gas entering, uh, passing through the turbine, um, which then drives the compressor. This is the wastegate valve here, so I can basically redirect some of the exhaust flow away from the turbine when I don't need it. Um, so this basically shows what I showed before. Uh, important part here is the charge air cooler, because when I compress that gas in the compressor, of course I heat it up, and there's a good reason to cool it down again. All right, namely increase the air density, gives me more air in my combustion chamber. Yeah, this is the slide I was referring to where we have, in this case, a V8 engine, <clears throat> and each bank has its own high pressure and low pressure turbine stages. Uh, the high pressure being a fast reacting turbine um, and the low pressure being a, a slower reacting turbine uh, and essentially compressing intake charge, driving up the pressures, the boost pressures, um, and getting more air into the combustion chamber. Um, this layout that you see here is shown here on a pallet, in this case with GT Power uh, commercial code, uh, where you have the low and high pressure turbines represented, uh, plus the connecting ducts and so on. So this is standard practice for uh, people in the industry uh, who are designing the engine system and laying out the, uh, the duct work, and making sure it can fit in the space constraints and so on. Okay, so we talked about boosting. Why do you want to do this? So this is a kind of interesting uh, plot here. Here's my intake flow passing through a compressor. Here's my intercooler. Cooling the gas is done after they've been compressed, but they're still at high pressure, entering the combustion chamber, and here's my exhaust. <clears throat> so <laughs> if I look at a pressure volume diagram, we saw these before, and I plot them on a log scale, I get straight lines, right? So this is pressure is proportional volume to the power gamma. I'm going from intake valve closure, IVC, to top dead center, and I'm compressing the gas. And while I do that, the temperature of the gas is increasing. And this is a fuel-air mixture, let's say. Let's say it's a compression ignition engine. At a certain temperature, I get ignition. Now, this could happen before I reach top dead center, okay? So what happens then, let's assume I have constant volume combustion, is the pressure increases and the temperature increases in the combustion chamber to the burnt gas temperature. And then I have further compression of this already burnt gas and then expansion. So this dashed or hatched region you see here, if I look at it from the point of view of work extraction, is wasted work, right? Because I don't have this, I don't have access to this part of the integral PDV curve that we were discussing before. So I, what I'd like to do is basically try to make this ignition point move to top dead center so I can regain this uh, wasted area on my integral PDV curve. Okay, so if I add a compressor, <coughs> which is this guy over here, what happens is that IVC, intake valve closure, instead of being at this pressure, I now increase the pressure and I compress following the curve you see here. Well, if the temperature was correspondingly increased, you can see I would get ignition even earlier. So if I introduce a cooler to keep the temperature where it is, I can avoid that. So instead of <coughs> having the temperature that would correspond to uh, this later uh, time of compression, that would correspond to having this uh, boost, I can maintain lower temperatures. And I do that by rejecting heat in the amount Q here through my cooler. So if I do this uh, appropriately, I can now 
phase the combustion event such that it occurs at closer to top dead center. And I can obtain more area under the curve by both removing this cross-hatched region and expanding the size of this uh, area in pressure volume space. Also, by lowering the peak temperatures, I lower NOx. So I get a double whammy there. And this boost really explains about 20% of the improved efficiency of diesels over uh, conventional naturally aspirated spark ignition engines. The boost is a, an important component. That's why we need turbochargers. All right, so let's look at some of the specifics of the compressor. <coughs> uh, essentially, centrifugal compressors are typically used in automotive applications. These are radial devices as opposed to axial compressors that you'd see in turbine arrangements, uh, in uh, gas turbine arrangements. Uh, they have a high mass flow rate, relatively low pressure ratios, pressure ratios around three or four. They rotate at very high angular speeds, 100,000 RPM, and are coupled with the exhaust-driven turbine. Uh, they consist of the inlet casing, the impeller, and a diffuser, which we'll discuss in a second. So in order to understand the performance of these devices, one has to go back and take a look at your compressible flow theory. Um, this is again from Anderson's book here. I've already discussed some of these equations with you, but I'll just review them very quickly. Turns out that compressors and turbines can be very accurately represented as flows in ducts with, with varying cross-sectional area. Compressible flows. All right, we start with Gibbs's equation, which I showed you before, that allows you to calculate entropy. And if I assume that I have an isentropic device, which is again a reasonable assumption, as we'll see, I can relate enthalpy to pressure changes. If I go to my energy equation, I get an equation that relates enthalpy to velocity changes. And by combining these two, I can derive what's known as Euler's equation, which says that pressure changes are related to velocity changes times rho times v. So just to remind you, <coughs> those of you who've taken undergraduate fluid mechanics classes will say, oh, I can integrate this equation and get Bernoulli's equation. Wrong. The reason is that the density is changing, right? So this is a compressible flow. You cannot integrate this equation directly. All right, so you need to figure out how to combine the density and the velocity. And so here you go to your mass conservation result that basically relates density changes, velocity changes, to area changes if you have flow in a duct with cross-sectional area variation. Combine these and you can derive these two equations, area velocity relation and area pressure relation. And you'll notice this quantity m here is the Mach number, the velocity divided by the speed of sound. So there's really interesting things happen here. If you look at a subsonic flow in a converging duct, all right, M is less than one, subsonic, right? The, the flow velocity is less than the sound speed. So this is negative. And that means that when the duct area is reducing, the velocity is increasing, just like you would expect, okay? Similarly, if you look at it this way, this guy <coughs> is uh, uh, less than one, the pressure is increasing. Okay, so that's what we, uh, uh, sorry, is decreasing from uh, Euler's equation. So that's what we expect. Now if you have a diverging duct, and it's again subsonic flow, you can show that the velocity decreases and the pressure increases, so you have pressure recovery. On the other hand, if you have supersonic flow, where the Mach number is greater than one, these things change around in an unexpected way. Namely, as you converge, or you have a converging flow, uh, you find that the um, Velocity decreases, okay, and the pressure increases. And similarly, with an expanding flow, the velocity increases and the pressure decreases. So the way to remember this is to remember what happens to you when you're driving down the highway in your car. And you've got two lanes of traffic here, and suddenly it goes down to one lane of traffic. What happens? If you were in a subsonic world, you'd speed up and you'd go through and there'd be no problem. 
but unfortunately, you're in a supersonic world because you don't know what's happening. A few cars ahead, you can't see them. Information is not coming back to you, just like it is in the case of a supersonic flow. You're traveling faster than the speed of sound, which is sending information back to you in a fluid flow, or here, the guy in front of you is blocking your vision, so you can't see what's happening. So you slow down you know, in this situation here, in the supersonic flow. On the other side, now you can speed up to your heart's content. Right? So there's a big difference between <coughs> knowing what's going on ahead of you and not knowing what's going on ahead of you, and that shows up in these equations. Okay, so if we model a compressor or turbine arrangement as flow in a converging, diverging nozzle, we can use those results. Basically, from the mass flow rate is rho times the density times the area times the velocity. We can determine uh, by replacing velocity by Mach number, sound speed by temperatures. We can determine a relationship that involves the pressure in the reservoir supplying the flow to the conditions at the exit of our uh, converging, diverging nozzle. Uh, and in particular, we can find the mass flow rate, which is going to be restricted by the choked flow point where you have the minimum area in the duct. At that point, the Mach number must equal 1, right? The flow velocity is equal to the sound speed. And using our area velocity relations and so on, show on, so on that I showed you on the previous slide, you can derive these equations, which shows basically uh, a uh, area ratio. This is this A star is your chug flow area. A is the local area. And you see the shape of the curve is similar to the shape of the nozzle, so it's easy to remember. You have a, <coughs> a reservoir at this side. The flow accelerates up to the chug flow point. Uh, and then on the uh, supersonic side, the flow accelerates. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, also th that would be in terms of Mach number. Because of the pressure change here, you can see you go from the reservoir pressure to a pressure that's, uh, you can determine that from our uh, equation here. If you plug in M equals 1, it's 0.528 times the reservoir pressure. That would be the, ch the pressure at the choke flow point all the way down to pressure of zero, where the Mach number is infinity if you had an infinitely large diffuser. Okay, Fliegner's formula is a very important formula because it allows you to relate the maximum flow rate you can get through this nozzle to the pressure in the reservoir and the minimum area, the throat area. So Fliegner's formula uh, essentially, uh, and also the temperature of the, of the reservoir gas. Fliegner's formula essentially allows you to say, this is the most uh, mass that I can pass through a nozzle of a given geometry. And that's used, uh, as we'll see in the design of compressors and turbines. To give just a little bit more uh, incentive to the use of these uh, flow analogies, here's my reservoir, here's my ambient, and I have, in this case, a converging nozzle. As I reduce the back pressure, so the reservoir, I'm showing you pressure over the reservoir pressure here as a function of distance down the nozzle. As I reduce the back pressure, flow is instituted, right? And uh, how, do, how does the reservoir know that the pressure here has been reduced? Sound waves propagate back, saying, please send me more, more uh, flow. Um, because I want the pressure to be equal to the ambient pressure at the exit. So you can see the pressure has to drop from the reservoir pressure to the back pressure. I can keep doing this until I reach the point where the flow at the exit of my nozzle is sonic. In other words, the Mach number is 1. If I now reduce the back pressure further, nothing else changes because information cannot propagate back to the reservoir because I'm already at sonic speeds in the flow at the exit of the nozzle. And so sound waves cannot propagate back to the reservoir. So that represents our choked flow point. <clears throat> so to give an example of how you might use this information in the design of a uh, throttle body uh, in an internal combustion engine arrangement, here's my piston. It's moving to the right, so I'm sucking air into my intake system. Here's my throttle blade. All right. Here's my atmospheric pressure, and here's the pressure behind the throttle blade. 
Uh, this plot is taken from Hayward's book here, and it shows that as I change the uh, throttle blade angle, phi here, I fall on different curves, all right? But for a fixed throttle blade angle, as I, uh, I'm plotting here the manifold pressure, right? That's P1 here. As I try to get more flow through the system, I eventually reach the choke flow point. And beyond that point, doesn't matter how much I lower the pressure here, I don't get any more mass flow through my throttle body. The only way to get more mass flow is to open up the angle here. So my converging duct has a larger minimum area and I move to a new curve. So basically, even in this very simple design, you can think of it as a converging, diverging nozzle arrangement. We use Fliegner's formula to say, okay, the maximum flow I can get through that system is given by this equation. This would be for Mach number equals one somewhere in the system. So I'm going to divide my mass flow rate by this quantity and present my mass flow rate as a normalized uh, parameter, which is normalized by the pressure and the temperature in the reservoir. Uh, and this is called a corrected flow rate. <clears throat> Basically, it measures a star here. It's a measure, it's a non-dimensional effective flow area. And then on this side, I have the total to static pressure ratio. And I'll talk more about that in a minute, but basically that's the pressure ratio across my device. The total pressure being the pressure in the reservoir, the static pressure being the pressure at the exit of my converging diverging nozzle. Okay, so if we look at a, <coughs> um, Sorry, just let me check the time. Yeah, we've got a break again. Uh, what we'll do after the break is um, take a look at compressors uh, in a, on a TS diagram. But basically, just to kind of orient you, a compressor is a converging passage, all right? Uh, and inside that converging pas passage, we have a rotating blade, which basically is pulling the fluid into the device. And then it passes through a diffuser to uh, regain some of the kinetic energy of that fluid and convert it into pressure energy. So basically it's a converging, diverging nozzle. And we'll be able to track on a TS diagram uh, what happens as you go from the inlet of the compressor to the uh, outlet of the compressor. Okay, questions about this part? All right, so what I'd like to do is take our 15 minute break. So we'll meet again at 11.15. And what I'll finish up then with is some examples. I'll, I'll discuss turbines and then examples of how you can use all of this to look at engine efficiency. Thanks.